hope is amazing of course it is and i've interviewed people with all sorts of illnesses over the years who have only survived through hope a mixture of hope and meds and then just hope you know hope is so important for us as humans i'm not i'm not declaring war on hope but it's also really hard to live with yeah and false hope is basically what i can't cope very easily with what i don't think anyone can cope with and and you could be like i've had different ivf times where you know, you're cruising along. It's not fully taken over your head. You know, I am very happily distracted, of course, by work, love, friendship, our son. You know, doing IVF with a with a child we can get to if you want is completely different, you know, and you, you've referred to that. But f- you just get to the last, once it's been put in the embryo, you know, and you, you've cashed your chips, basically, and you are waiting for the dice. You're waiting to see if it's going to come up for you. And you're just screwed. Like, the last... 10 11 days before the pregnancy test and you're just you know you're living on hope and then your hopes are dashed all your luck comes in and then you have a miscarriage in my particular case and of course my luck very much came in the very first time in in 2017 um and I know it's a crass analogy but it kind of works for me and I find hope one of the most cruel elements of the whole thing when do you know it's false hope, though, is my next thought. Yes. Because you don't, do you? You, it's you, you, you declare if it is or not, I guess. Yes. Um, well, I know when, in this particular scenario, of course, there's lots of other scenarios with hope, I know it's failed, our false hope, when I start to feel my period come. So the only good thing about having endometriosis in this context is your body quite definitely tells you when a period is coming. And I have a particular set of symptoms. And it will ha- it will happen two to three days before the pregnancy test. I will feel my body, the pain come in. It's sort of like going under and dragging to the floor, legs hurting. And I know quietly it's, it's not worked that time. And I started not to want to tell my husband straight away because I'd like him to have a bit more hope for a little bit longer. And he is so much more optimistic than me. Obviously... He's not having his mind changed by, you know, yeah, hormones. Yeah. And we're having hormones anyway, but then synthetic ones. Um, but I don't like killing his hope. I, I really don't. That's a big responsibility for you to carry around on top of all the stuff that you're dealing with for you. Yes, because I could be wrong. And so I haven't usually been wrong because I do feel I know my own body. But that last time that I did get pregnant, which is the only the second time I've ever been pregnant, because I can't do it naturally, I can't do it without assistance... I had actually had period pains. And so my mind was blown. My mind was blown and I Mm. hadn't thought it had worked. So that was quite weird because I thought, gosh, the only bit of certainty I've always had is that I kind of know my body. And then I felt my body slightly played a trick on me. But, you know, I wasn't going to get angry because everything for a very short space had had gone well. I mean, you ask a lot of open questions in the article about... Well, you're sort of alluding to hope in a sense because you're saying, you know, when do you stop? How many more rounds of IVF do you do? And obviously there's <clears throat> varying situations that will impact that. Obviously financially, if you, as you've already talked about, it's an extremely expensive thing to do outside of the NHS structure. But also emotionally, to go on that emotional roller coaster again and again, I guess only you know when enough's enough and, and you can't go through that anymore. Yeah, I mean, if you told me, Fern, I was going to do what I've done, I wouldn't have believed you as in terms of uh, how many rounds that we're at. And and when I got back to work after maternity leave, I deliberately, with my producer, created a programme where IVF hadn't worked. And it was sort of my love letter. Um, I had a whole group of women on who had spent many millions of pounds and they did not have many children. A couple of them had had them. And I... It was sort of weirdly my not love letter to them, but I wanted to I wanted to show them to the world. I wanted to help share their stories because I don't I like following up stories, I like seeing how stories end, and I want the media to have stories in them where it hasn't always gone right. So a lot of them have, as you say, check out when they have to check out for various different reasons. And I think I'll know when it's the right time. Um, I mentioned in the piece this woman I go marching around my neighbourhood with. 
um, and the whole concept of IVF fairies, which is a really nice I thing. I love this. Talk to, <laughs> because, you know, friendship becomes the backbone of so many conversations on this podcast with whatever subject we're I know, covering. I, I hear it as a and theme. It's, Beautiful, and I but I love the IVF fairy concept. <laughs> well, I didn't know about it. It's, it's like gorgeous. it's like a secret underground network of uh, women not wearing wings, but might as well be. And um, the very first time I was doing an injection, I was doing an awards ceremony, and this, you know, when you can sometimes just say something to a stranger that you could never say to somebody you mm. know. And I don't know what it was about it, but she was the woman um, on stage helping me hand the award. I was hosting. It was a business awards event and she was helping me hand them out to the right person. And she was just lovely and she looked gorgeous. She had a nice air, you know, air about her aura. And I just was a bit scared to go to the toilet and put this needle in my tummy. I'd never done it before. And I definitely couldn't ask my husband because he's so squeamish. So I'm like, I'm not one of those people who, if you do have a partner, has a partner who's like, I'm totally there. I'm putting the jab in your butt. You know, it's not that. I am alone uh, with this particular issue because he, he, he faints with right. having his own blood taken. Not actually, but nearly. And so I just said to her, I'm doing this crazy thing. I'm going to go and put some drugs in my tummy before this awards do. She's like, oh, I've had IVF. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? And her two children were through IVF. She said, I'll be your IVF fairy. Give me a name. Give me a number. Gorgeous. All of that. I said, what's that? And she said, just text me anytime. Have a little chat. I'll boost you. I'll boost you up. I was like, is that a thing? She went, yep, you need one. Like, real business-like. So I, I said, love it. Okay. And, you know, she used to send me things like, have a bit of pineapple, have a few nuts, maybe Brazil nuts. Like, oh. not saying it was going to make me pregnant, but just nice things for your body. So you know? lovely. And um, that's where it began. And then fast forward, I now have three or four women who dip into me and to kind of pay it forward. And I, I have to say, you get to know each other really quickly when you ask each other questions. Or, But my particular one for each other is a woman who lives down the road and we have a child the same age. So it's very... Um, pleasant, should I put it like that, that we both have a child, so we don't have to um, accommodate each other's story yeah. that much that's different. It's 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 nice to match, it's a weird thing to say. We have sep- slightly separate medical issues. She also is a doctor, so she's got great knowledge that I don't have. Not necessarily about this, but just about general yeah. things. And honestly, you don't want to be near us when it hasn't worked. You know, we mm. literally march and cry and have... I think one, you know, during lockdown when you were allowed at that point to have a walk with someone, I remember we had like quite similar big puffer coats. It was really cold and I like lay, I filled them with beers. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do that when I was a teenager. I used to take the lining out the bottom puffer bit and stuff beer down there. Oh, very So cool. old school, Emma. I, like I mean, it. I took like three beers of whatever yeah. I had, you know, a gluten free one, obviously. <laughs> and um, we just marched about. Oh. And she has got me back in the saddle, actually. She's got quite a lot of hope. I've, I've got a bit of a hope deficit. 